faith in the name of Jesus. Because we're not claiming this for Pentecost or for Kinsey or for anybody. We're claiming this for the name of Jesus Christ. We're putting the name on these people. We're believing in confidence that God's going to minister to them and that every name that is listed on these prayer requests, many of these names mean a great deal to you because you're connected with them either by friendship or family. You call their name out. You believe that God is able as we pray to release his power and allow it to flow until his name is glorified and we lift him up and praise him. In the name of Jesus, Holy Ghost, touch Brother Abe. Let the healing virtue flow. In Jesus' name, we trust in you and we believe, God, that you are able. Every name that has been called here, you're able to minister. Touch Sister Pam. Touch Brother Anthony right now in the name of Jesus. Let the Holy Ghost touch Brother Peak. Let there be healing ministry right now. in you, God. I'm believing in you, Lord. I'm believing in the work of the cross, the work of the blood. Either God does it or he does it. Either his word is true or it is not. Does anybody believe that God's word is still true and that he will honor his word he will confirm his word. You can return to your pew. Brother Welch, come and minister to us in taking the offering. <laughs> now, this is where everybody needs to shout. You remain standing. That way, it make it easy for you to get out in the aisle and shout a little bit. Amen. Ushers, if you'd come forward, it's just good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. We've got some people sick. In fact, Sister Shirley has been sick for a little while here. And uh, one of the great things in her life is she's got me for a husband. Amen. We have a... Uh... Brother Bobby, did you do that? We have a woodpecker at our house. And uh, that woodpecker, he gets on our metal gutter. And he gets up there and he just pecks away and pecks away and pecks away and pecks away. But he's like a lot of people. He never gets anywhere. But he'll get up there and, then, brrr, you know, just rattle that thing off. And, and uh, but he never gets anywhere. Like the Indian said, keep big thunder, no rain. But really what that woodpecker needs to do, he needs to do what he was put here for. That's to peck on trees. You know, you know, I've often said about marriage, if everybody tend to their business, everything will work out fine. Now listen, listen oh, wait a minute, I get through telling you what to do. Okay. Okay, it's not a, the Bible said for a woman to reverence her husband. Now, it's not the man's job to make his wife reverence him. The Bible says for a man to love his wife. His job is to love his wife. Her job is to reverence her husband. Now, if we spend all our time trying to make the wife love, my husband love me or the wife reverence me, then you're not going to get, you don't, you're going to be like the man didn't get anywhere. There's going to be a lot of thunder and no rain. Amen. If everybody just do their part. You know, living for God's not all that hard, really, until you make it that hard. You come with all these things and, you know, and all these deals, you want people to jump through hoops and all that sort of thing. i tell you one thing. If somebody wants you to run, run, jump through a hoop, you be sure they jump to it, through it first, okay? Somebody gets up and tells you how to have a great, 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 great. Well, Bob, you said, well, get out there and show me how to do that. Just, just, just show me how. See, you, you, this is a testimony. This building here, this, this is a testimony to you folks tonight. This is it. It speaks for itself. We don't have to get up here and tell how great you are, but even though you are great, this speaks for itself. That's the way it is living for God. It just kind of speaks for itself. Jesus, thank you tonight for your greatness and your mercy and your love. Bless us as we give in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
the mighty God is Jesus, the Prince of Peace is He, the everlasting Father, the King eternally, the wonderful in wisdom, by whom all things are made, the fullness of the Godhead is Jesus, is His name, and His soul. Has anybody come to exalt the wonderful, powerful, glorious name of Jesus? Now, you might be tired tonight. You might have had a lot of adversity and difficulties this week. But Jesus is still just as good as he's ever been. And he's worthy of our praise. He's worthy. In spite of our weariness and our tiredness and all of that, God is still God. And he loves every one of us. And I think he's glad that you're here. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. But I believe that he's glad that you're here to worship and to welcome his presence into this place because God wants to work in the midst of his people. He doesn't have a problem wanting to do that. If you don't have the notes, just lift your hand. Our ushers will bring you the notes real quickly here. Just delighted to have all of our guests here. We welcome you to this Wednesday night service. Why don't you turn to a couple of the people around you and smile at them and shake their hand and welcome them to the First Pentecostal Church? I have, we have some new people here that I've never seen before. May You may have attended here before, but I haven't seen you. But we're delighted that you're here, and we're just so thankful that you came. Now, don't visit all night. Because I've got to teach the lesson. I've got to teach the lesson. And so I want you to be blessed. Here's the lesson tonight. We've been talking about the great doctrines of the Bible. It is time for a revival of the name. Not just theologically, not just doctrinally, in the sense that we systemize and we place all of our doctrines and our understanding of truths in different categories. And there's nothing wrong with that because it helps us to remember it. And there's nothing wrong with remembering it. I think it's good for us to remember what we believe and know what we believe. But I'm talking about the power of the message and the doctrine of the name. That when we pray in that name, he hears us. That when we call upon that name, he answers us. When we speak that name, his presence comes into the place. And that, we need a revival of the name of Jesus Christ. Because I have come not in my own name because there's no power in my own name. But there is power in the name 
of Jesus Christ. We come in the power of the name of Jesus Christ. And you are gathered here in his name, and we place the name of Jesus upon you and, and bless you in this place. Of course, how many of you have been baptized in his name? You went down in water in the wonderful name of Jesus. Well, there's no substitute for that right there. There, there is nothing in this world you could substitute for that. That is a powerful experience. That was not just an act of obedience. It is an act of obedience, but it's more than that. It's a supernatural work that God does within you that buries the old man, remits your sins, washes them away. The old man is dead and buried and gone. And now you rise to walk in the newness of life. And that's what coming to church is all about, is to refresh your mind and remembrance of those truths and principles and energize you so that you can continue your new walk. How many of you know that the newness can wear off sometimes? <laughs> and the excitement you got Sunday can wear off by the time you got 40 telephone calls through Tuesday. And everybody's this, that, and the other. And then by Wednesday, you don't even know who you are. And then you're here tonight saying, Preacher, remind me. I looked in that perfect law of liberty, and now I don't even know who I am again. you got to remind me. That's what I'm here to do. I'm here to remind you that Jesus is still on the throne. He's living in our hearts through the power of the Holy Ghost, and you have the name of Jesus. You're not just anybody. You are Jesus' kids. Does anybody believe that you are a child of Jesus Christ, a product, a son of God? Join heirs with him. <laughs> oh! Join heirs. You're, you've inherited all of these wonderful things. Here's my text, Acts 15. You'll probably have to turn in your Bibles because it's not in your notes. Because I'm going to do slides that's not in your notes, okay? I'm going to do slides that are not in the notes. I want to talk about the name of Jesus in history and how that God has never left this world without a witness. There have been people that have baptized in Jesus' name all through the centuries. The reason why you don't know that much about them is because whoever wins the wars writes the history. <laughs> and, and I'm going to be just flat honest with you, the Trinitarians wrote the history. So that's why you don't know a lot about these groups. But they did exist, and they were very influential, and they, were, they angered uh, the Catholic Church of that day and provoked some of the inquisitions, some of the inquiries into that, and were, became martyrs as a result of that. They were killed for the name of Jesus Christ. But here is the theme. This is, if you want... And of course, we talk about revival. Revival is simply uh, the church being awakened to who they are and, and being rededicated and coming back to Jesus Christ and getting on fire for God. That's what revival is. We use that as a catchphrase to refer to a lot of different things in Scripture. But harvest is when we reach out into the world and bring souls, lost souls into the church for them to be saved. That's harvest. So we get revived so that we can experience the harvest. Because I want to be busy in the harvest field, reaching out to lost souls, being a witness to people, and doing everything that I can to plant the Word of God. I can't save anybody, but I can sow the seed. So what you've got to do is just sow the seed. Are you sowing the seed? It's not how many souls have you won, whether you've won one or 5,000. Because I'm telling you, if one soul repents, heaven throws a party. So our numbers, our numbering system, I mean, how many people have to get the Holy Ghost in this house before you think we're having revival or whatever? One, two, five, five thousand, ten thousand, fifteen thousand, ten million, ten billion. Well, there's not ten billion people on the planet yet. There will be shortly. There's no nuclear war. There'll be about 10 billion here in a few years. But I'm going to tell you right now, God is still God no matter what. And if one sinner repents, you ought to be excited about it because heaven's having a party. 
When you get your value system, listen, the, 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 the shepherd will leave the 99 and go searching for the one lost sheep. And if he finds the one lost sheep, he calls all his friends and say, ah, we got one lost sheep back up in the house. Calls all of his friends. How many, how many telephone calls have you gotten from friends when one person got the Holy Ghost? Unless it was your son or your daughter. Oh, Y'all need to just clap your hands under the Lord right now and thank him for his goodness. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll preach all night, but let me read this and then you can sit down. Acts 15, 14. Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his namesake. And then verse 17, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. The only way you can call the name of God upon the Gentiles is to baptize them in Jesus' name. There is no other way. And then when you baptize them, you call the name of Jesus upon them. And he does all these things. He's the one that instigates salvation. He is the initiator. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Is he not? Okay, God bless you. You may be seated. I could tell you have sitting down in your brain. Jesus' name baptism in history. I want to share with you a few names that you perhaps do not recognize. They've not talked about very much. I have given you the notes which gives you understanding of why this church places so much emphasis on water baptism in Jesus' name. And that it would be administered only in the name of Jesus. And that if we do administer water baptism, it will be by immersion in water, calling the name of Jesus over you. Because we believe that that is the only name whereby you can be saved. Now you have to understand that the church started, and there's different dates that people have that the day of Pentecost either in 32 or 33 AD there's different opinions of that but regardless of exactly what date it was that's when the church began that's the first century church the early church and they went everywhere preaching Jesus Christ and God confirming his word with signs and wonders following all during that first century that the name of Jesus was the only way water baptism was administered by anybody in Christianity. It didn't make any difference whether they were Gentiles, whether they were Jews, whether they were uh, in Ephesus or Colossae or Philippi or Thessalonica or Rome. It didn't make any difference where they were. Everyone was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is uncontested. That is uncontested by theologians. That is uncontested by historians. As a matter of fact, the historians will admit to you that the formula or the means of baptism was changed. And it was initially changed in the 2nd century and then it was finalized in the 4th century in 325 A.D. at the Council of Nicaea. But people began to change the doctrines of the church due to all of the influence of the Greek philosophers. These people were real. And in the second century, the majority of Christianity baptized in Jesus' name. And there were a few people that began to get their Greek uh, philosophies and trying to entwine them in the church so they can make the gospel more relevant to the culture so that they could have a wider appeal for more people to join the church. So they wanted to create a plurality of gods rather than the one true God because the first century church had no concept of three gods or trinity or anything else. Their only understanding they had was there is only one God and his name is Jesus. There was no other. It was, it's uncontested in history. 
As a matter of fact, theologians today have had their great meetings in other countries and places. And some of my friends have been in attendance at those meetings. That one of the reasons why Christianity cannot seem to spread to other areas of the world and certain areas of the world is because of their extra biblical doctrines that they can't find in the Bible. One of those doctrines was the doctrine of the Trinity and the formula for baptism, which was clearly changed by those people who were influenced by Greek philosophy. But in the second century, Montanus, the Montanus, Montanus was a very powerful individual. He was accused of claiming to be the Holy Ghost incarnate, but that is a false accusation by his opposition. They bore false witness against the man because he wanted the gifts of the Spirit to still operate in the church. And so when he would interpret a tongue, he would do that in the first person. As we do when we prophesy, I, the Lord, say unto you. How many of you times have you heard somebody say that when they've interpreted? He did the same thing, but they accused him of claiming to be the Holy Ghost incarnate. But anywhere the Holy Ghost starts moving, guess what? People go back to the original plan because the Spirit leads and guides you into all truth. And the only way to stop truth from being revealed as a result of a moving of the Spirit of God is to shut the Spirit of God down. If we lose the moving of God's spirit in this church, we will lose truth. Because it is the spirit that leads and guides you into all truth. And it is the spirit that reminds you of the teachings of Jesus so that you can hold on to them when you're in a storm. Montanus definitely baptized in Jesus' name. And the people that were called modelists by the opposition that wanted to introduce this new plurality of gods and this new concept in the second century, they began to introduce these thinkings into the church system, trying to change it to make it more relevant to the culture. That's what's happening today. You see, this isn't the first time somebody's tried to make the gospel relevant to the culture and change it. <laughs> And make it a little bit more palatable. And we don't need all this shouting. And we don't need all this worship. And we don't need the moving of the Holy Ghost. And we don't need the name of Jesus. And why do you have to be so adamant about that? And why do you have to be so dogmatic about speaking with other tongues? Don't you know that makes people uncomfortable? Sure it does. It's supposed to. Because everybody in this Scambia County is saved. They can live like the devil and they're still saved today. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If you get the Holy Ghost moving, it'll convict you of sin and it'll reveal to you that you're not all right and that you need to get right with God. So there were people in the second century and the majority of Christianity still baptized in Jesus' name during the second century. As a matter of fact, even into the third century, it was very widespread even in the third century that people continue to baptize in Jesus' name. The civilians, Stephen of Rome, endorsed Jesus' name baptism. Uh, and even to the 4th and 6th centuries, there were people that continued, even after the Council of Nicaea, even when the Roman Catholic Church came out in persecution against those that did not adopt the change. In the formula of baptism, they did not adopt it. They continued to baptize in Jesus' name, although they were persecuted. And they were put down, and they were called fanatics. They were called a lot of names. Some of them were not good. They, they, were, they were put down continually. Now, for whatever reason, you know that when Brother D.L. Welch started this church and even when in his evangelistic campaigns was preaching the Holy Ghost, there was a lot of persecution from the religious world against the operation of the Spirit. They threw tomatoes. They were going to kill him. They were going to do all kinds of things. I've heard all of the stories. Aren't those neat stories? I just don't ever get tired of listening to them because that's where we came from. And we've got it good today because everybody's a tongue talker and everybody's spirit filled. And are you spirit filled? Yes, I'm spirit filled. And everybody's spirit filled when they, and, and, and that's fine and that's dandy. But you see, we've gained an acceptance in society that we did not have before. 
And there's a danger in that because we can lose our distinctives because because the enemy wants to do everything he can to make us blend in and be just like everybody else. Well, I don't know if you ever noticed it, but we don't dress like the world. We don't look like the world. We don't act like the world, and we are different. Yeah, we don't just simply baptize in Jesus' name or we'll baptize you any way you want to, just whatever suits you. We're going to baptize you according to the Word of God. That's not United Pentecostal Church doctrine. That's not D.L. Welch doctrine. That's Holy Bible doctrine. Does anybody still believe that the Bible is the final authority in what we should do, especially when it comes to salvation? As a matter of fact, there was a pope in the, in the 7th century, Pope Nicholas I, who endorsed Jesus' name baptism. That is a fact of history. And even one particular council got together and recognized the fallacy of the triune formula of water baptism and endorsed Jesus' name baptism as the only scriptural way to baptize because that was the doctrine of the apostles. Now you hear about the apostolic fathers, but the apostolic fathers were not the apostles, nor were they influenced by the apostles. There may have been one or two of the apostolic fathers that actually heard John preach. That's a possibility. But they were not directly mentored, nor were they ministered to by the apostles. And what they call apostolic fathers did not believe the true doctrine. They were Greek apologists that were trying to gain advantage in their culture by bringing Greek philosophies into the church and mixing them together with pagan thought, thinking that they had a better way. Oh, I mean, haven't we ever heard that before? We got a better way. There is no better way than the Bible. My God, I'll run and jump on my own message if I have to. I'll declare unto you there is only one true way, and it's in the book. There's not 500 ways to get to heaven. There's one way. There's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism, and we need to get back to the book and stay with the book. It was mentioned by Peter Lombard and Hugo Victor Bonaventure and Thomas Aquinas, the Anabaptists, the Huguenots, that's not in the notes, but the Huguenots also baptized in Jesus' name. Even Baptists and some English people that were called heretics, the Plymouth Brethren, even John Miller, a Presbyterian, stood up and said, we need to get back to the book because the only way they were ever baptized was in the name of Jesus. And they, during these centuries, down through the years, have baptized in the wonderful name of Jesus. I've just seen a correlation as we go to the next slide. Jesus' name, baptism among the early Pentecostals, Charles Parham, who was in Topeka, Kansas in 1901, and he began to pray about the Holy Ghost. And a lot of these people began to preach that you can get the Holy Ghost, and they didn't even have the Holy Ghost. While they were preaching that you could get it, they were just standing on the Bible. Seymour was one of them. He was an African-American gentleman, and he heard Charles Parham teach about it, and he believed it because he saw it in the book, but he didn't even have the Holy Ghost. And they even went to Bonnie Bray Street in the Los Angeles and started what we know as the Azusa Street Revival and didn't even have the Holy Ghost yet, but they were preaching it because they believed it was the Word of God. And so sometimes, now just I'm just throwing a little thought out here at you because I don't want to mess you up. But sometimes you got to start preaching stuff with faith before God gives it to you. That you don't always get it and then get to preach about it. Sometimes you got to preach it to get it. I just thought I'd throw that thought out at you. As a matter of fact, that's a scriptural principle. Is if you look at praise, the difference between praise and worship, and we Pentecostals haven't learned the difference between it yet, but praise is pre-presence. You don't ever praise God when the presence comes. 
that's when you transition into worship. But praise is pre-presence. Praise waiteth for thee in Zion, O Lord. I will praise the Lord, and the Lord will hear me. That means that you praise to attract the presence. But when the presence arrives, you move into worship because you can't worship long distance. You can praise long distance, but you got to worship in the presence. We're always waiting on God to do something before we praise the Lord. He said, he said come into my gates with thanksgiving and into my courts with praise. Before you get in my presence, you walk in praising God. What would happen if everybody here on this Sunday morning would walk all up in this house praising God before the first note was ever, ever spoken or sung or played or whatever? I'm just a thought. I'm just throwing this out at you. I'm not trying to mess you up. But it's true. We've got to, you, you, praise is always pre-presence. And then you enter into worship when the presence comes. Now, see what happened to these guys like William Seymour, Charles Parham, William Durham. They started preaching the Holy Ghost. Now, Seymour actually uh, got the Holy Ghost on Bonnie Bray Street in Los Angeles at the beginning of the Azusa Street Revival. He finally, he, he'd been preaching it. As a matter of fact, he was so hungry for it, he went to Houston, Texas before that, and he listened to Charles Parham and some of the others talk about the Holy Ghost. They had received it. It had fallen already at the Bible school in Topeka, Kansas. But because he was African-American and because there was segregation, he was not allowed to enter into the classroom. He had to stay outside, sit in a chair, and listen to them teach about the Holy Ghost. But he was so hungry that it did not matter that when finally at the Azusa Street Revival, the Holy Ghost fell, the color barrier and the segregation completely was obliterated by the operation of the Spirit. And there was no difference whether they were African American or whether they were Anglo-Saxon. They all received the Holy Ghost evidence by speaking with other tongues. Why? Because when we get to heaven, there's not going to be different sections in heaven where the Gentiles over here and the Jews over here and the women over here and the men over here. It's not going to be that way, but every tongue and every kindred and every... Woo! Hallelujah. That's the reason why God has given us a multicultural church. Because I want this church to look like it's going to look like when we get over there. Amen. And so Andrew Urshan, as a matter of fact, when I went to Russia... I met some of the descendants of the converts of Andrew Urshan. He had had such an impact in baptizing people in Jesus' name that many of the Christians that we found that were, that were not tainted by any seminary-trained preacher over here in America were baptizing in Jesus' name and believed in one God. We're finding this out in China where they have not been touched by any of the Korean trained seminaries. Korea trains a lot with uh, Dr. Cho and then they train people in the Trinity. You got you to gotta train and indoctrinate that kind of stuff into people because it's not scriptural. So you got to beat it into them another way. I want to be able to take the Bible to prove what I preach. Not go to a seminary or a seminar or whatever else. Huh? I want them to be able to find it in the book. Pure and simple. But when I get to hearing about all these stories of how it all started back at the turn of the, 19th, of the 20th century, this is just awesome when you think about what these men did and how that they uh, blessed us. The baptism of the Holy Ghost at Azusa in 1907 different uh, developments. William, uh, I, I, yeah, stay with William Durham. He was the one that said Acts 2.38 is God's standard of salvation. He started talking about baptism in the Holy Ghost as the seal of the finished salvation in Jesus Christ. 
and that he has only one standard and one standard only of receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost and it's not getting knocked down and feeling chills and running around. It's speaking with other tongues because that's the only biblical evidence. You say, well, Brother Kinsey, I already know that. Well, you are, if you already know that and believe that, that ought to be the most exciting truth in the whole world because that's the message that will change people's lives. What do you think, your little program's going to do it? The program can't do it. If Jesus is not exalted in this house, there is no healing here. If Jesus is not exalted in this house, there is no revival here. There's no harvest here. It's just a show and a program. But I'm telling you, you get Jesus loose in this house, and the power of God begins to move, and people will be healed and delivered and saved and changed and transformed, and on and on and on it goes. Amen. Ha! Woo! I'll tell you what. I get excited about this kind of stuff because we need a revival of the name of Jesus among Pentecostal people who have gotten jaded in their life. They no longer feel the vibrancy of the truths that saved you. You've been saved by these truths. That's what saved you. Your name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life because you're a member of First Pentecostal Church. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life because you repented of your sins, were baptized in Jesus' name, and filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost and believe in Jesus Christ. That's the only reason why. Now, we want you to be a member here because we love having you come. I want you to come more often. I want you to come every time the doors are open. I want you to... Enjoy being a, a member of the church. And that's where you can kind of work out your soul salvation. It's where you can find out where, whether or not you're really developing and maturing as a Christian. Because you don't know whether you're forgiving people until you come against people that mess you up. <laughs> you, you say, I have the love of God in my heart standing at home in the closet. Uh, yeah, you have the love of God in your heart because you ain't meeting nobody. Come on up, you know, come on to church. Meet a few people. Well, who does he think he is walking by me and not shaking my hand? <laughs> then we find out how much Holy Ghost you really got. Because him shaking your hand is not going to change your soul salvation one bit unless it puts a seed of bitterness in your spirit. And then if it puts a seed of bitterness in your spirit because so-and-so didn't shake your hand or you talked to somebody and they walked away and they snubbed you because they thought they were, that they were above you or that you were beneath them or, huh? And then you walked away and you, yeah. That's when you need to walk away and praise the Lord because it don't make any difference what anybody does. Jesus died for you. And if that person hasn't matured in Christ enough to value your salvation, that's his loss or her loss, not your loss. And don't let it lose your soul over it. Come on up in here and worship. Well, they don't like the way I worship God because I worship a little louder than everybody else. Well, go ahead and learn how to flow in the spirit and in the service. There comes a time when you need to let the service go on. There comes a time when you need to respond to the Holy Ghost. It just... You got to get the flow. That's what Sister Freeman taught me so many years ago when I was just a kid preacher. And she and I loved it because Brother and Sister Freeman, when I got up and preached, and I was just spitting, you know, spam and all this. And I was just, you know, I didn't have no polish. I just got up there and got excited about Jesus. And they loved it. They acted like it was the greatest thing since cream cheese. And these were great people. I mean, they were great people back then because they were old back then. That's how old they were when they left us. They were old when I was young. All I've known, man, they, they're my old people. And, but they were excited about me preaching. They were excited about the message. Well, how can you be excited about a little old kid preaching when you've been in Africa and saw miracles and all kinds of craziness and God translating your car and, and just doing all kinds of craziness? You've heard all those stories before. Man, hallelujah. I've never seen an angel, and yet my brother Stephen, who does not serve the Lord, one night Aunt Catherine woke up and the Holy Ghost spoke to her and said, you better pray for Stephen. Two or three men had jumped him and were going to beat him to death. 
And two ladies in white walked up and rebuked those men, and they ran off. I've never seen one angel, and my brother gets two. What's up with that? But you see, it's sparing his life so that maybe one day the message that he's never responded to, he'll walk down that altar and get the Holy Ghost. Who knows what will happen. So it's not about all of that stuff. It's about staying faithful to the truth. Amen. And Ari e. McAllister, John Ewart, an associate of William Durham, he introduced the oneness concepts. Glenn Cook, an associate of Seymour, picked up the message, began to spread it out. And, of course, there's a lot of history behind each one of these names, and we could tell stories about them, but I don't have enough time to go through all of that. Frank Small in Winnipeg in Canada, uh, the Canadian brethren, who are a part of the United Pentecostal Church. We are a uh, partner together. We're not the United Pentecostal Church of the United States or the United Pentecostal Church of Canada. We are the United Pentecostal Church International because we are partnered with Canada in a, together. And, and it's, they're wonderful people. As a matter of fact, the Canadian people have put, I don't know how many missionaries on the field. They are missions-minded people. And I love preaching in Canada because they're all on fire for God. Everybody says, oh, they're up north and they're cold and they don't worship God. Uh -uh. They out worship people in the south. They will worship every meeting I ever go to. Those people are worshiping people, praising people. So I, 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 I love the Canadian brethren. But uh, you can go to the next slide, Frank. You were, and, and Cook began to... Now, now here's, here's a little history. The Assemblies of God were form, was formed in 1914 by Howard Goss and Ian Bell were the original founders of the Assemblies of God and many other leaders, including founders of five major groups. They all came together to make the AOG in that day. Now, Ian Bell, Brian was going through his dad's, Brian Parkey's my son-in-law of pastors in Poplar Bluff, and W.C. Parkey was a pack rat. He loved to keep stuff. And he kept an original track that Ian Bell, who was the leader of the Assemblies of God, who came out for Jesus' name baptism in the very beginning. And he got the original track from Ian Bell, now, of course, we know that Howard Goss is a part of our history because we split off from them during what they called the, the new issue or whatever it was that they said it was. And we, they, they kept to the Trinitarian, and we left in 1916, walked out because of the name of Jesus. And Howard Goss walked away from that, and Ian Bell stayed with the AOG and then changed his view on it because of the pressure that he was getting politically from the other preachers. I'm just trying to help you with the history here of how all this came about. And, and, and of course, if you'll go on, uh, G.T. Haywood, y'all remember, I see a crimson stream of blood. He was one of the most powerful men of God that really preached the word and the truth in Indianapolis, Indiana, and had a great church and he and Andrew Urshan were very close and dear friends and they had a relationship as a matter of fact when God gave uh, G.T. Haywood that song I see a crimson stream of blood I don't know how old Nathaniel Urshan was at that time but he went to Andrew Urshan's house and said I've heard from God and they began to sing that song and brother Urshan was telling us how the Holy Ghost fell in the home and they were they were on their face before God praising him I see a crimson stream of blood they were so thankful for what the blood had done in their lives. Amen. Early oneness organizations, the General Assembly, the Apostolic Assemblies, 1917, the PAW, Pentecostals Assemblies of the World, 1918, three new organizations in 1925, and then finally two, Pentecostal Church Incorporated, Pentecostal Assemblies of Jesus Christ, 
forged and formed the United Pentecostal Church, which we belong to, and that merger took place in St. Louis in 1945. And we are still going strong. Many nations. Uh, Brother Andrew Urshan, you can go ahead and show the slide of Brother Andrew Urshan. And it was just such a joy to be able to baptize one of the descendants in, in the water. When I went to Russia, one of the descendants that had not yet submitted to water baptism but remembered their, their father and their grandfather teaching about the oneness of God because they were influenced by the preaching of Brother Andrew Urshan who went all over Russia before Russia fell to the communists, he would preach the word of God and declare. And even after that, he still would just sneak in and start preaching the word of the Lord. You can't stop God's words. You can't stop God's truth. I don't care. I don't care how powerful the government is, and I don't care how many nukes they have. You can't nuke this. Praise God. Woo! Hallelujah. I said you can't nuke truth. And it prevailed, and then I got to baptize one of the descendants. So that was all cool. Jesus' name baptism was practiced from the beginning of the Pentecostal movement, and many early leaders embraced it. Ewart, Cook, Haywood, Urshan, and others who had begun this oneness Pentecostal movement. But the true founder was the Holy Ghost. This is what I have seen. And this is what I want to tell you, and this is the reason why I speak with such passion and conviction. Because the assemblies of God have decided in their spirit they don't want truth. And when you refuse truth, the Holy Ghost can't work in your midst. Because one of the primary functions of the Holy Ghost is to lead you and guide you into all truth. And that's why when the, uh, the present leader, Dr. Trask, when he was leader of, the, of AOG, he was saying that most of our people don't even get the Holy Ghost anymore. They just join the church. You can't join this church without getting born again of water and of spirit. Yes, we have a membership, and yes, that membership has to be qualified because of all the legal ramifications in our country today. But we qualify our membership, but that doesn't make you a member of the body of Christ. The only thing that makes you a member of the body of Christ is that you've been baptized. I'm not against any group. I'm just simply sharing with you, when you reject the Holy Ghost, truth cannot operate anymore. You will believe a lie unless you keep the Holy Ghost fresh. That's why we need worship in this place. That's why we need shouting. We need tongue talking. We need word preaching. We need it all. We don't just need one component. We need the whole thing, spirit and truth. They that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. That doesn't invalidate anything that's ever been preached in this pulpit. That validates everything that's been preached in this pulpit for years. And has been preached over and over and over again. I mean, the majority of Pentecostals stay with the church tradition. However, today only in a minority in these churches still receive the Holy Ghost. Because once you forsake truth, you shut truth down, Holy Ghost can't operate. Because one of its main functions is to lead you. Whenever the Holy Ghost started moving on Seymour and Cook and Ewart, they got the revelation because the Holy Ghost convicted them that they were not obeying the Scripture, that they were obeying reprobate counsels of the medieval age that had changed the original formula. And the Holy Ghost convicted them. Ha, <laughs> ha. That's the reason why there's no holiness preaching in their churches any longer. They have to put on a show, and they got to put on some dancers, and they got to choreograph their dancing and the reason why they have to choreograph it because the Holy Ghost ain't moving on nobody God forbid that we should have to choreograph our dancing ah you say well I don't know about all that debt well it's scriptural you say well there's only one verse that talks about dancing in the spirit or dancing in the in the king well there might be one verse but there was only one verse that ever said he would be born in Bethlehem and God honored that 
The precedent that I have is that David danced before the ark and he was mocked by everyone around him, but he knew where his power was. It was not in himself. It was in the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother, we're not taking dancing out of the church, but we're not going to choreographic either. We're going to dance before the Lord. And there's still people that jump and leap for joy. Say, do you leap to get it or do you leap because you've already got it? I, I believe in both. I believe in a dual translation, double translation. If you ain't got it, leap to get it. And if you do have it, leap because you got it. They're still dancing in this church. They're still hand clapping in praise. That's biblical. That's not Pentecostal. That's not Southern. That's not this. That's not unsophisticated. That's the word of God. And he said in Acts 15 that he would raise up again the tabernacle of David. And the tabernacle of David is still alive. Jesus has not come back yet. So they're still praising up in this house. They're still worshiping, and it's all right for you to do it. And you're not ashamed of the gospel of his name. It's time for revival of the name. There's over 20 million oneness constituents right now in the world. And that's not counting if I understand correctly, and I'd have to check this. Those in China that we do not yet know about the full extent of just how many millions. There's not thousands, church, in China. There are literally millions of people, and they're getting the Holy Ghost every day. And they have to meet in small groups. I don't care. You don't have to have a big church. You can have a small group. And if you've got Jesus in the house and somebody is calling on the name of Jesus and truth is preached, the Spirit is free to work. Now understand, many of these people preached the Holy Ghost before they had it. Because sometimes you got to declare it before you get it. And that's the reason why many of us stay sick instead of being healed is because you think God will heal, needs to heal you, then you praise him for the healing. You need to praise him whether you get healed or not. <laughs> praise him whether you get healed or not. And then speak it as if the healing has already been accomplished. Because, oh, hallelujah, with these stripes ye were past tense heal it's settled at calvary does anybody believe that anymore in pentecost or are we losing it i feel like montana's up here they were losing the spiritual gifts in the second century and he saw it and he rose up and said we got to do something about it we still need the moving of the holy ghost they accused him of a lot of junk that wasn't true they said we're of the devil they said d.l welch was of the devil he wasn't of the devil. The Holy Ghost had a hold of his life. You're not of the devil because you talked in tongues. You're not of the devil because you come in here and the choir starts singing and you start boogieing, uh, whatever you want to call it, dancing in the Lord. Whatever it is, you say, well, I'm, I'm more sophisticated than that. You got too sophisticated for God. You don't have to act like me and run the aisles and jump up and down and do all of that, but you can clap your hands. You can at least look amen if you can't say it. Give me a Baptist nod or a Methodist amen or a little Catholic holy water. I'll take anything because we, if church, if we're going to hold on to holiness, we got to have a move of the Holy Ghost because it's the Holy Ghost that will convict people of their sin. You're ranting and raving in the pulpit. It's no longer relevant. We need a sky blue sin killing revival that'll touch. I can rant and rave and carry on, pound the pulpit and try to bully everybody into holiness, but it's just not going to work in today's society. I can promise you that. That might have worked 50 years ago, but the bully pulpit doesn't work anymore, and I think I know why. God is calling us back to the biblical pattern because it was never intended to be that. God's always intended his truth to be declared in love. 
and for his Holy Ghost to move to convict the hearts of men and draw them. It has always been that way. That's the biblical model. I don't know, say, well, well, my models work this, that. I, it may have, but I can point you to churches that are ten times this size. So do I use them as a model too? Do I go to the mega churches that's got 50,000 people in their church? And do I model after them? They're not modeled after the word of God, but they're successful. But success is not how many you got. Success is whether or not your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. And it don't make any difference. And I'm not against numbers. And I hope we fill the whole building up and got to go to multiple services or whatever you want to say. But I'm going to tell you right now, I don't want you to be lost. I want you to make heaven. And I want your name written in the Lamb's book of life. Hallelujah. Does anybody still want the old-fashioned biblical model? Do we go to the emerging church? Is that where we go to get our model? They're successful. They're running 25 and 30,000 in some of their churches. Do I go to that model? What model do I go to? No, I'll tell you what my model is. It's going to be this old black back book called the Bible. That's my model for everything I want to see happen. And there is no other model. I want the book. Because if I get the book, it don't make any difference if they persecute us, throw us in jail. They can do anything they want to. We'll have the victory. We'll be shouting in jail, doing a jailhouse rock. Instead of sucking our thumb, feeling sorry for ourselves because we can't go to the movies. got so many sulking Pentecostals because they can't go to the movies and they can't go to the beach with their bikinis and they can't do this and they can't do that. And they're sulking about it. And that's why they won't praise God anymore because they're mad because they have to live holy. That's ridiculous. I'm on it now, so y'all might as well just come on with me. I know it's Wednesday night, but we might as well have Sunday night on Wednesday night. Because I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to sit around and sulk about what I cannot do. I'm a child of God. I've been washed in the blood. I've been bought with a price. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. And if you think I'm going to suck my thumb because I can't go and entertain myself with Hollywood for the rest of my life till I'm so drunk as if I'm on cocaine. We preach against cocaine and then we're so drunk on American Idol and Grey's Anatomy and this movie and that movie that we can't even come into the house of God and worship where our attention spans not 20 seconds long. My God, we need to get away from that mess and walk up in here and say, where's Jesus in the house? Where's the power of God in this place? We need a move of the Holy Ghost. You're not going to move people with your program. The carpet in the pews ain't going to move them. But I'll tell you, one touch of the blood, one touch of the master's hand, one touch of the name of Jesus, and everything can be transformed. Hallelujah. You can have this. You need a revival of the name and the biblical model. Praise God. So I want you to stand. Because if y'all keep me, I'll preach all night like this. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, church. We can't sulk. We got to start believing that if we're, if we're going to believe this, then let's believe it. Let's get some conviction about us, some passion about it. It's serious business. I'm not preaching to exclude anybody. I hope God saves everybody. I don't care how God does it, what he does. I just want to obey the book. Because I'm going to tell you something. I, give an account, I have to give an account for everything I preach. Whether I want to or not.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I know there's a desire in your heart. You wouldn't be here on a Wednesday night. I know there's a desire in your heart to receive from God what we need. I know you want to see it happen. I know some people may not want to make the consecrations and give up some of their hurts and their pain to have it. But I'd rather just go ahead and forgive and put everything under the blood and walk on with Jesus without bitterness. I'd just rather do it that way. Yeah, I get I get mistreated for that. Sure. Yeah. It's like one brother told me. He said, you gotta raise your tolerance for pain. You just gotta take a little more pain. I said, really? <laughs> I gotta take more. Just raise your tolerance to where it doesn't affect your prey. So you need to raise your tolerance for pain and don't let it affect your praise. I'm looking at people that have lost loved ones, but they're still in church. God didn't save them from their sickness. We pray. We ask the Lord to do it. I asked God to save Janet, but he didn't do it. He took Linda so fast I didn't have a chance to even present it because the Lord showed me when I heard that she was into surgery that the Lord was going to take her. So I, I don't know. But I'm not going to let it affect my prey. Why? Because my only chance to see him again is to be saved. So I'm going to dance like David danced. I'm going to praise like David prays. And you can mock me if you want to, and that's fine. I've been at Pentecost all my life, and I've been mocked by the biggest and the best. And they still haven't changed me, and they're not going to change me now. Hallelujah. The most powerful in the world. But they can't change this because I still believe in the book. The word's still true and the word's still right. So I'm going to dance. I can't run like I used to run because if I do, I'll quit preaching for a while. I'll be wheezing. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to dance anyway. As long as I can. I can't do it as long as I used to, but I'll do it as long as I can. Huh? It's all right if you can't run like you used to. It's all right. Some of you, it hurt yourself, I can tell. Some of you lift your hand, you'll probably lock it in place just right up there. <laughs> so you might have to do this. Because if you do that, it's going to lock in place, and then you'll have to go to the chiropractor and get it popped out. Then you'll be mad at me. He told me to praise God. My arm locked in place. <laughs> Amen. But go ahead and praise him anyhow. Praise him whether the presence is here or not. Praise him. If you want revival, you want God to move in your life, just step up here and just say, I want Jesus to move. I really believe that what we heard tonight from the Lord is true. Man can't, I don't care how you try to do it. And I've tried. You can't do it. God's not going to respond to a man's way of doing revival. God brings revival when he's ready. I just want to be faithful, and I don't want to be at the zoo when my dock comes, when my ship comes in at the dock. I don't want to be at the circus. I want to be where I'm supposed to be. So when God decides to do whatever he's going to do, I believe we heard from the Lord, man can't do it. Man's never been able to do it. Never will be able to do it. Never has done it before. Hallelujah. Do you hunger for it? 
Do you thirst for it? I'm so hungry for God to move. I'm so thirsty. As in a dry and a weary land. I'm hungry. But I'm going to praise him because I believe in the power of the name. I believe in the power of the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let the Holy Ghost come upon you right now. You need to reach out unto the Lord. You need to seek after God. You need to request the presence of the Lord to come upon you. You need to respond to the Lord as he moves on your heart. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. That's it. Believe God. Trust in Him. Let the Holy Ghost work in your life. If you need healing, then ask for it. Speak it. Claim it. Preach it before you get it. Speak it before you receive it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I will bless the Lord and I will praise his name forever. He is a mighty God. He is a mighty God. Oh, yes, go ahead and let the Holy Ghost start working in you right now. Let the power of God and the fountain of life begin to flow out. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want the name of Jesus on my life. I want the revival of the name. Reach out and pray with someone around you. That's also scriptural. Hallelujah. Pray for one another. Lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. Yes, pray with them that the Holy Ghost would move on them and minister to them. We need a revival, church, in our own heart and in our own life. God, change me, transform me, help me, change me, Lord. Oh, Come 
That's it. Cry out to the King and let the Holy Ghost minister to you right now. He will fill you with the Holy Ghost. He will fill you with the Holy Ghost. Oh, the Holy Ghost is real. The Holy Ghost is real. The Holy Ghost, as the Bible teaches, is real. name of Jesus, set her free. In Jesus' name, set her free. Right now, in the name of Jesus, set her free. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, let there be victory. Let there be liberty in the house. In the name of Jesus, he can deliver you from every addiction. He can break every habit. He can bring revival to every heart. Jesus. Beautiful presence of the Lord in this place. A beautiful presence of the Lord. I want you to just lift your hands now and would you just thank the Lord for what he's done in this service. Thank you, Jesus. Hayaranda bo shati ala nala moria. Sataba kaya la diri aranda. In the name of Jesus, go everywhere and tell everybody about Jesus. Go everywhere and tell everybody about Jesus. Tell them that you can find Jesus, and Jesus is in the house. Jesus is in the house. Jesus is in the house. Go find Jesus in your own personal life and tell every one you meet. You can pray as long as you like. God bless you. You're dismissed. I love you. Thank you for coming on this Wednesday night. I'll see you here Sunday morning. 10 a.m. is Sunday school, 11 a.m. Oh, excuse me. I forgot. Stop right now. Turn to your neighbor and say, Friday night, we're having prayer. And so be here for prayer. It's 7 p.m., 7 p.m. Friday. Remind them. Now, also, if you can sponsor a kid to go to youth camp, please write a check, place it in an envelope, whatever, but put youth camp on the check. Hand it in to the office, put it in the offertory, whatever you need to do. You can hand it to me, Sister Diane, and we'll see to it that it gets 